Welcome to the NAACP Forum. I'm Bishop Tony Branch. The NAACP Forum is Brockton's choice for all of civil rights news. Listen, I have a, a group, a great group of panelists tonight to discuss one of the most important uh, topics, especially in the uh, African American community, those of African descent with respect to prostate cancer. Um, but listen, before I get started, I have to tell you all about my friends that are going to join me tonight to ask, answer some tough questions around this disease and what's being done about it. First, I have, you know, yes, uh, as you can see, Bishop's getting older now, so putting my glasses on. First, I have Michael Curry, who serves as president and CEO of the Massachusetts League of Community Health Centers, which represents 52 health centers serving over 1 million patients across practices here in the Commonwealth. Community health systems were born out of the modern civil rights movement by physician and research activists who wanted to bring quality, affordable health care to communities and popula populations that are often ignored. What they wanted to do is look at disparities around disease, poor health outcomes, inadequate sanitation and housing, and food insecurity. Michael Curry also serves on the National Board of the NAACP. He chairs the board's advocacy and policy committee, and he is the past president of the Boston branch of the NAACP. Michael, in 2020, was appointed by the Massachusetts Senate to, to the legislative created Health Equity Task Force, which he now co-chairs, aimed at addressing health care disparities and now, and now has been realized and magnified by COVID-19. Michael also was appointed to the Governor's Baker's COVID-19 Vaccine Working Group. Michael is not only a friend, he's a mentor, a mentor to many of us that are in the healthcare field. We welcome President Michael Curry. Also joining us is Dr. Trend. Dr. Trend, if I've said your name incorrectly, charge it to my uh, brain, not to my heart. He is the Associate Professor of Surgery at Harvard Medical School. He just got out of surgery prior to joining this program. He's also the co-director of the Dana-Farber Brigham and Women's Prostate Cancer Center and Director of Ambulatory Clinical Operations and the Division of Urological Surgery at Brigham's and Women's Hospital. My, uh, Dr. Trin is also the lead faculty for Cancer and Comparative Effectiveness at the Center for Surgery and Public Health which is a joint program of Harvard Medical School and Harvard School of Public Health. Dr. Trin is one of the key leaders in research on inequality and outcomes of cancer care. Dr. Trin received his medical degree from the University of Montreal, Canada, where he also completed his residency in urology. A friend to many of us and very familiar, Dr. Stern, we welcome you. Dr. Stern is the president of AdmiTech Foundation Dr. Stern founded Admitech in 1997. Dr. Stern has been a leading groundbreaking leader with respect to state and national international programs with respect to prostate cancer research, education, awareness, and advocacy. These programs have been creating a new standard of patient care, reducing healthcare disparities with respect to African-American, Hispanic, and Latino males. Based on her achievements, she has received multiple accommodations from the governor of the Commonwealth, Massachusetts General Court, Boston City Hospital, and was named Woman of Influence by the Boston Business Journal in 2016. Dr. Stern, as a Chief of Diagnostics Imaging Research for the branch at the National Cancer Center excuse me, and Institute, was also the Associate Director for Science and Technology, a very strong resume. Dr. Stern worked in the Office of the Secretary of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services in the same capacity as research. Dr. Stern led radiology research at Harvard Medical School, Beth Israel Medical Center, and Boston Children's Hospital. Dr. Stern has been the leading and participating in, in numerous scientific and advisory committees, including the National Academy of Medicine and President Biden's Cancer Moonshot Program. I welcome you panelists today. You are a blessing, and let's just begin. Dr. Stern, could you tell us what is prostate cancer? Actually, I think Dr. Trink, as an expert, as a clinical You're expert, it already? Yes, I will be in the best position to say to describe that. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, prostate cancer is, uh, you know, uh, cancer by definition is uncontrolled cell 
peripheral, right? Um, and so that we're talking about a cancer in this organ uh, called the prostate, uh, which is deep in the pelvis and, you know, uh, present in men. Uh, the, the thing about prostate cancer, uh, and I'm sure we're going to talk and tackle a little bit of these issues uh, as part of our conversation today, is that uh, a lot of men will get prostate cancer at some point in their lives. Uh, for example, uh, if you look at men who are above the age of 80, you're going to find potentially more than half of men have prostate cancer at that point. Um, but as you can imagine, these cancers may not necessarily kill them, and they will die with the disease rather than from the disease. Um, but the problem would be that if you get prostate cancer at age 50 and it's serious, uh, then you know obviously you can die from it. So uh, you know it's it's a it's a it's a tricky trade-off. You know, try to understand which men should be treated for prostate cancer, um, especially that there's a lot of side effects potentially to treatment as well. Dr. Trin, we began this relationship with Dr. Stern a, 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 about five, six years ago. Uh, Steve Bernard and I uh, met with Dr. Stern around prostate cancer. And one of the reasons why we did that is because in Plymouth County, we were two to one in terms of dying. I'm talking about African-American male, people that look like me from this particular disease. I understand that you're talking in, you know, in the generalities, but why does it impact Af those of African descent? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough question, right? Um, I think that the, the facts are clear. Um, I think that the data shows that African-American men are twice as likely to die of prostate cancer compared to white men. Um, the reason is still up for discussion, and I'm sure it's a combination of many things, uh, but there's disagreement among the experts about which is which. Um, I think that there's a lot, there's good data to suggest that African-American men may be more likely to develop prostate cancer uh, compared to white men or Asian men, for example. Um, but uh, it's unclear that being predisposed to get prostate cancer necessarily means that you're more likely to die. Um, and uh, as I will talk about, and a lot of my research has been on, I do feel that a lot of the reasons why African-American men are more likely to die of the disease it's not genetics, but rather, um, you know, issues in regards to access to care, social economic considerations, you know, like, frankly, structural racism, et cetera, et cetera. I think those issues probably play a huge role in the, the, the mortality difference rather than purely some sort of genetic issue. Well, well, let's, talk, well let's, let's talk a little bit, Dr. Stern. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, diagnostic. Let's talk a little bit about uh, testing. So I, I'm in the doctor's office yesterday getting uh, my annual physical. Um, and he tells me, and you and I talked about this two years ago, digital exams are not a part of the, the regimen anymore, according to what they're saying on a national level, that that is no longer recommended. So in terms of testing in terms of people finding out if they have it. Where are we in that discussion? Uh, absolutely. Uh, before I will um, talk about uh, screen, uh, advances in screening and diagnostics, uh, Tony, um, I would like to say a few comments. There is hope, great hope, for uh, um, reducing health disparities in African-American men. Uh, and there was a large study that came out at the end of January um, uh, 20, uh, 2020. Uh, and this study came from, um, the study was performed in thousands of African-American and uh, uh, white men. And what it showed that in VA system with equal access to care, there were equal outcomes. And, once, and these outcomes did not depend on the level of education on, or on the level of uh, income. Uh, so there is great hope. And the best hope we have to equalize care is, to, is through screening and early detection. You're absolutely correct. And your physician is absolutely correct. There is controversy surrounding digital rectal exam, not among experts, but among general practitioners in general. Um, there is a clear cut greater benefit from blood testing or called PSA for screening um, compared to digital rectal exam. Uh, blood, sc uh, blood screening, blood test screening 
allows to detect prostate cancer much earlier than physical examination through digital rectal exam. By the time you can feel it on digital rectal already... exam, it may be too late. Uh -huh. By the same token, in a small percentage of men, digital rectal exam is extremely helpful because PSA, for some reason, even in men with uh, fairly aggressive prostate cancer may be low. And that's where digital rectal exam can be very helpful. Um, Kwok, do you want to comment on digital rectal exam from uh, clinical yeah, I mean, um, perspective? I, I think what you, you know, we start this conversation on like, why is the, there no more recommendation? And correct. You know, I, and I, I think that, um, you know, from a, then this is just putting on a hat of public health and society. I think the calculus, and this is not bad, a bad calculus, you know, if you are, you know, coldly looking at the numbers, mm -hmm. you could argue that the efforts and efforts include what it means in terms of money, infrastructure, getting all your primary cares working, doing all this work is, is not necessarily uh, worth the amounts of potential life saves, quote unquote, right? Um, and it, it's obviously extremely controversial, right? You know, like the people who are uh, urologist, but I guess in a way I'm biased because that's what I do. And I see people dying of prostate cancer and all that. Mm. Uh, don't feel strongly that there's a benefit to it. But then some people like crunching the numbers, looking at what it means, they say, well, it doesn't add up. But one thing that concerns me that I think is extremely important to discuss in this forum is that remember, you know, things don't, it's not one size fits all, right? And when they make these recommendations, they're based on right. data that apply mostly to, again, right. you know, the, the white men, Right. and what it means for them. But, um, you know, one of the things that disappoint me and other experts is that there are no specific recommendations for populations that may be more at risk, including African-American men. And many people, including myself, have voiced their concern about the fact that there's not a specific recommendation for African-American men, maybe saying that, okay, maybe not screening for everyone, mm -hmm. but screening for, or judicious screening for African-American men, but the, they basically just put everybody in the same melting pot, which is that, uh, you know, it may or may not be worth it. Now, did, just to answer the question about the digital rectal exam, uh, you know, I agree with everything that Dr. Stern said. I, I think that, uh, that, you know, the difficulty is sometimes when you feel something with the finger, it may be too late, right? You know, if I feel, if my little finger here can do an exam and feel a big tumor, that's probably not a great sign. Right. Um, and also, and I'm sure we're going to talk a little bit more about this, we may be in an era now where MRIs are 1,000 times better than my finger, um, but then MRI is, uh, you know, $1,000 and a digital rectal exam is close to free. So but there are other considerations, but, I, you know, it, 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 we're coming to a realization that the digital rectal exam uh, may not be as good, you know, in the new era where we, you know, combine PSAs and MRIs and all that, uh, but, uh, you know, it, it's still controversial, obviously, and I think we all agree on that. So President Curry, tell us, you know, Dr. Trent started out by telling us, hey, uh, there's a problem here in terms of uh, racial disparities, racial inequality, racism, institutionalized racism. What are we doing about that in terms, and you're doing, quite frankly, you're doing great work uh, in your presidency uh, over all these clinics, but what is, what is happening in terms of combating this inequality that is a part of your, your sphere? Yeah, and I appreciate you, Bishop, uh, and, and the organizers, the NAACP and Brockton for having me. You know, I, I think about um, that uh, old phrase, and I think it's been attributed uh, to W.E.B. Du Bois, the founder of the NAACP, mm. um, or James Baldwin, uh, but it really doesn't matter. We could, we could attribute it to both of them. But nothing can be solved that can't be faced, right? And we've not wanted to face these disparities have an origin. And that origin is about race. That if you want to think that people want to have higher rates of HIV and hypertension and diabetes and heart disease and almost every form of cancer, and it's just because of their lifestyle, then shame on all of us for thinking that's about race. Um, that is also about um, lack of access to care, lack of insurance. That's about disparate treatment in the wake of the Institute of Medicine's 2002 report about how doctors have historically, even today, don't treat us the same. And that's not about attacking any one individual doctor. It's about a system that is never similar to our criminal justice system and our, our housing systems and our education systems 
They were not necessarily built to treat us the same. And we're now having, in the wake of George Floyd's murder over a year ago, mm -hmm. this, this awakening, this reckoning that our system has been broken generally, right? That's why we have medical errors. That's why we have um, other issues in our healthcare system with insurance to care. But we're also finding that race has been a taint within that system. It makes no sense. And if you think about um, the number of cases of, of prostate cancer, cancer in general first, right? Let's talk about the general cases. Yeah, yeah. I think it's somewhere over 200,000 diagnosed just in 2019. I think those numbers have been pretty consistent. Uh, a majority of those being women, um, a smaller, a, a little less percentage being men. Um, and then when you think about the fact that for black men, that could be a death sentence. That that's real, right? What is that about Black men and Black women that make them um, susceptible at a higher rate to death from this disease? That's all of our problem. And I think to your question, Bishop, we got to come to some realization about how we got here. Uh, I was uh, dealing with the prostate, the American Cancer Society recently, and I've worked with them closely right. in the role with health centers. And they were throwing some numbers out at us. Prostate cancer, second leading cause of cancer death in Black men, estimated uh, 5,350 deaths expected. Just was 2019 numbers. I'm not even know the doctors on the call may know the more recent numbers, but these are all disturbing. The numbers don't change that dramatically. Right. Um, a non-Hispanic black men have the highest death rate for prostate cancer of any racial ethnic group in the US, 2.2 times higher uh, in the non-Hispanic than non-Hispanic white men. I mean, the numbers speak for themselves. Race ipsa loquit is Latin phrase. The thing speaks for itself. Right. The, the health centers and the role we play, Bishop, is we're in the front lines. We're the canaries in the coal mine. Yeah. So we're in those communities with those higher rates of prostate cancer, those higher rates of diabetes, asthma, heart disease, HIV. And it's our charge to figure out how do we solve for the social determinants of health? What are those underlying factors that are making us sick, that are making us more susceptible to disease and are quite frankly, having higher rates of mortality, morbidity and mortality in our communities. Prostate cancer is, as we know from the data, uh, top of that list that yeah. we need to figure out why is it that we're not, um, what we're you know, uh, being uh, confronted with this disease, while we're not getting the, the timely access to care that we need to save our lives. And, uh, and I think there's an urgency to that now post COVID because a lot of people um, were avoiding care in the last year, yeah. and and those diseases didn't go anywhere. So I, I guess where I'm a, I'm a bit concerned is so the American Cancer Society released that in 2021 there's been a 30 percent increase in prostate cancer. Um, clearly, the assumption can be that a, a large number of those that are part of that are African American, those of African descent. So so Dr. Stern. Are, are we realizing a higher number because of diagnostic and testing? Why has that number uh, increased to, to a 30% increase? That's a great question, uh, Tony. I don't think we have an answer because okay. what we do know is uh, close to 30, uh, uh, what we've seen nationally, at least, according to my friends in urology, breast cancer experts. Uh, we've seen during pandemic, we've seen 30 to 40% reduction in screening. So I would suspect that men did not went to their physicians only because they had symptoms and they were scared about something. This increase can be attributed only because uh, there were more uh, people with symptoms. I also cannot tell you why American Cancer, American Cancer Society for Massachusetts, for example. Mm. In 2021, we had over 6,500 cases. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had fewer cases. I am not sure we have answers. Um, Kvok, what, what is your opinion on these numbers? Uh, yeah, I, I, I tend to agree with uh, the things you said. Um, I, it, it's, it's complicated, you know, trying to analyze that because you know, detecting prostate cancer is dependent on what is really happening out there. You know, if, mm. we, if we pick up a bunch of people and actually looked into this deeply and figured out if they had prostate cancer or not. So, so yes, there's, there could be an actual increase in, you know, prostate cancer in African-American men, but it could also be a screening issue. You know, like, for example, like as Dr. Stern said, you know, if, 
if people were not being screened and these people had cancer and now they're all being found post pandemic or or post you know the first few months of the pandemic then the numbers are going to be inflated but they're not inflated because more african americans are having the cancers just because they were not detected prior um and on that point you know we talk we, we talk about institutionalized racism all that that stuff i you know, this is this is the kind of thing that you know, like I think is shocking to a lot of people and, and frustrating is that uh, you know the pandemic happened. We had to adapt, right? We we right. couldn't bring people into clinic and all that, and uh, and then uh, you know um, government and rightly so said, okay, we need to do telemedicine, we need to do telephone visits, but it's all you you often see the same things, right? You know, you have certain parts of the population telemedicine comes in, uh, no problem in uptaking, adopting it. Uh, okay, this sounds wrong. Why don't you go do a PSA? Okay, I'll call you back. You know, and, and then these people were uh, being diagnosed and still being detected with their prostate cancer during the pandemic. Um, but unfortunately, you know, certain uh, parts of the population, um, uh, especially those who don't speak the language, that's even worse. Yes, right. They're not going to use telemedicine. They're not going to, you know, like we're going to, you know, you try to call them. They're like, what is this a physician appointment? They drop the phone. They got less to fall because nobody does anything. They finally get symptoms and then they show up with a cancer and it's too late to be treated. And that's extremely frustrating. Um, and it, it's frustrating also that when you hear certain hospitals saying, well, telemedicine video visits pay more. I'm, I'm talking the truth here, right? The, I know you are. The telemedicine video visits pay more than telephone visits. So we should adopt uh, only video visits. But if you're only adopting video visits, it means that the person has to be able to use Zoom which then even makes it harder for certain people to have access to care. And, uh, you know, for example, I, I'm happy my institution uh, on a positive note, uh, you know, figured that out at some point and said, okay, we have to accept telephone visits even if the person can't do Zoom. But, you know, obviously if you're thinking only bottom line of the hospital and saying, I'm just taking Zoom visits and then you're not taking phone visits, you're gonna cut off like a huge portion of the population who are in need and who are being neglected, uh, you know, in the midst of a pandemic, right? So, Bishop, so I, I, Bishop can I add one little quick point to that, please. Dr. Friend's comment? Bishop, you and I were just earlier today with Senator Elizabeth yes. Warren, and, and one of the most powerful comments that I think was mentioned needs to be lifted here, mm -hmm. which is we learned some valuable lessons on the COVID-19. We learned that um, there's a distrust in our healthcare system that the history, a taint of from, uh, um, um, the taint of experimentation on slaves with uh, J. Marion Sims to Tuskegee Syphilis on down, right? Even lived experiences today. Mm -hmm. But what I thought was powerful that from that conversation you and I were in earlier was this issue of bringing care to where people are. Right. That COVID taught us that, you know what, if they won't come, you got to go to them. And prostate cancer is a great example of that. How are we bringing the prostate cancer screenings, the care, to where people are because sometimes they won't come to the healthcare institution they won't come to a health center they may not come to a hospital they may not come to a clinic of some sort so how do we now use what we learned in COVID-19 which is if you really prioritize communities that are disparately impacted by any disease right one of the keys to doing that is you got to come to our church you got to come to our community centers you got to knock on our doors if we really get the urgency of this and we talk about the death rate, I think it's 39.8 deaths per 100,000 between 2012 and 2016. If we really take the urgency of that data, we should be bringing this, this news and the, and the news of the doctors on the call tonight and the, the life-saving strategies to where people live, like Brockton, like areas in Brockton where we know prostate cancer is going to rear its ugly head right, yeah. and, and we can't wait for them to have a symptom to come in. So Dr. Stern, let me ask you, we need, to, and thank you, President Curry. Let me ask you, one of the things that uh, folks have asked me about, especially a little bit after the uh, February uh, presentation, uh, February 25th at the State House is that they still, and this is why I go back to what is prostate cancer, they still are not understanding the basics of this disease. So let's begin at the basics. We, we have some time here. Tell me, I go in for my annual physical and what am I saying to the doctor or what should the doctor be doing? I'm 40 years old around prostate cancer, around prostate diagnostics, I'm sorry, testing. Um, I would like to make a suggestion with your permission. On June 17, 
uh, at 6.30 p.m. We will have another uh, in a series of many events we've had in Brockton, as yes, you know, yes. over the last five, six years. Um, and we will have uh, Dr. Trink, we will have other experts, and that's exactly what we will be discussing. So I would really invite everyone who is watching this program to join us on June 17 at 6.30 p.m. We appreciate that. So that's the virtual event that, that we're going to be sponsoring. Um, Dr. Stern, but I'm not letting you off the hook. <laughs> so so, so, so I'm, I'm 40 so years old. I'm 40 years old. I go into yeah. that doctor's office. What's he doing in terms of my prostate? Or should be doing, excuse okay. me. Okay, absolutely. Be doing. And, uh, uh, and what we will be discussing on June 17, uh, actually, are pro and cons uh -oh. of screening. So that men... A screening, like any other tool, it has advantages, it has disadvantages. Um, I must say that there are a lot of disadvantages of screening discussed in, in the media and uh, in general medicine discount that, this, that advantages of screening uh, completely override disadvantages for high-risk men, such as African-American men. Yes, right. Yeah. So that's the bottom line. Okay, so uh, when we started our program in early 2000, uh, in 2015, and then we had our first event in two the, 2000, in January 2016, yep. at which Quark participated, uh, we surveyed about um, 14 men, 50, um, age 50 and older, among leaders of Brockton and AACP. And what we found was shocking. 50% of men, seven men, 50 and older, among, edu we, uh, and, uh, among people who lead education in the African-American yes, community yes. in Brooklyn, yes. did not know they were at high risk of prostate cancer. So the fundamental issue to deal with is prostate cancer awareness. And exact, it comes back exactly to the question you ask, what do you do when you face your doctor? If your doctor does not offer you PSA screening and you are 40 years and you have family history of, of prostate cancer and you are African-American man, you must ask for PSA screening. If you do not have in your family brother or a father affected by uh, prostate cancer, you need to talk to your doctor at the age of 45 uh, to request yeah, the PSA screening. I agree. Even if you does not tell you that you're at high risk okay, as an so African American. I, it's it's so um yeah. you know just in a short. They, I mean I agree. I think it's controversial though in your case because you were forty, right, Bishop? Yeah, that's what you were mentioning. No, 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 no. I'm way over there. Yeah, yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but but thank you. I'll take it. <laughs> but, but no, the people, young folks have been asking me, and I when I say young, folks, I'm talking. 40-year-olds, 30-year-olds have been asking this question because uh, to what Dr. Stern is saying, you know, to piggyback off that a little bit of that is that they're seeing all of this different, if you Google it right now, there are so many different guidelines. And what I'm trying to figure out from you all, um, and I'm gonna talk to you, or get back to Michael on messaging, but what is the what should really be happening based upon the national standards? That's one thing. But then the second thing that, Dr. Trent, you kind of answered that because the standard really is based upon Anglo-Saxons. So, so, so yeah. we have a problem here. So yeah. I, I, you guys tell me what, what does a 40-year-old black man need to do at his annual physical? So 40-year-old <clears throat> black man, unless you have a really strong family history, it's still a little early to be okay. like, you know, going straight to screening. Now, uh, if you have a family history, if somebody in your family died of prostate cancer or had prostate cancer that was treated, I think it makes sense to like at least have a conversation and discuss the pros and the cons. Uh, but I'm not sure that every black man who's 40 years old should go straight to like a PSA test. But it's worth engaging a conversation. Okay. And as Dr. Stern said, if, I think if the doctor doesn't want to engage in conversation, doesn't that doesn't seem right, right? You know, you should have a conversation and there should be a plan in place, right? And, and Bishop, Bishop, very important to this point uh, that the doctor just said, Dr. Trent. So one is in the black and brown community, we may not even know the medical history of our family. That, that's it, yeah. So, so you may not even know that prostate cancer, because we are very guarded around our medical history. And when yes. somebody passes, they say, well, they, 
they had cancer. We may not even know what type of cancer. Mm -hmm. and, and that limits us in knowing that we may be more likely to get cancer at an earlier age, like almost like COVID, the arguments around COVID, right? right. The white folks who got sick of COVID-19 were older. Many of the folks who got sick of COVID-19 were younger black and brown folks throughout this pandemic. So we need to be able to say to our doctors, and I'll just say this one last thing. Doc, my doctor, my primary care used to send me for tests, particularly because he knew as an African-American who didn't know, I didn't know my dad. Like I didn't have a relationship with that side of the family. I didn't know my mother's medical history of her aunts and uncles and grandparents. He would send me to tests, but he would say, you know, I'm gonna get penalized for sending you to a test. That you know, you know, there's a there's a penalty I'll pay in terms of whether this is appropriate to send you at a test in your 30s or your 40s, your early 40s. And he ended up leaving the medical practice he was in because he felt like it limited his ability to provide the interventions he needed to deal with the equity challenges of healthcare for me as his patient. That's an interesting conversation yes. we've not really had in this country yet. Oh. The, the lack of information that some of us have about medical history. And then allowing doctors to do what they do best, which is to use their training, their expertise, and make the right choices. And it may yield no result for you, Bishop. You know what? It turned out you don't have it. Mm -hmm. But it's better safe than sorry. Sorry. Because we can intervene and get you the care that you need. I think that's the challenge. This conflict, and I teach healthcare policy, is this challenge between cost, quality, access, and choice. And sometimes they're competing. And because we want to keep down the rising, overwhelming cost in healthcare, it impacts those other three: quality, access, and choice. It's an interesting dilemma, right? But we end up paying the price as poor black and brown folks. So Stop. the bottom line, the bottom line, Tony, if you are forty-year-old African American man, and your brother or father had prostate cancer, you must start conversation about screening with your doctor, even if your doctor doesn't. If you do not have um, brother or father stricken by prostate cancer, you must start this conversation at the age of 45, no later. No, no later than age, that's, that's the standard. So our, 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 our audience, the standard is 45. And it's, can, is it okay if I say, especially if you're of African descent or that's 45 even if you're white? No, I think it's 45 because- Period. Yeah. Yeah. No, because you are of African descent and more likely to develop prostate cancer. Hence, that's why it's important. Uh, I think for white men, like, you know, some people would say 50, some people say 55, but yeah. it's a little later. And that, that is why I think it's important to have separate guidelines depending on, you know, race, which unfortunately we do not adopt. And right now it's just the one size fits all uh, for everyone. So let me just, and you, either doctor can jump on this. So tell me a little bit, I think it might be Dr. Stern. Okay, what are the advances? Even though the American Cancer Society has come up with this 30% increase, is there a better chance that I'm gonna be alive in 10 years once I have a diagnosis? Yes, compared to five, 10 years ago, I think in my judgment, there's no question. We have tremendous, I will let Dr. Tring to talk about advances in treatment but I would like to point out what he already started talking about, and this is advances in diagnostics. One of the problems with prostate cancer, he pointed out at the beginning, yes. we do not know which prostate cancer is aggressive, even in African-American men, and should, uh, and should be treated right away, and the way it should be treated. And uh, um, what prostate cancer is not aggressive and should be carefully observed before we, we start treating and or biopsying and causing um, uh, complications. So there are extremely precise diagnostic tools these days. Um, blood tests, urinary tests for molecular markers, uh, imaging, and we had the privilege of leading MRI development mentioned by um, uh, Dr. Trink uh, at Admita Foundation. Um, MRI transformed our ability to see prostate cancer um, and to figure out which prostate cancer is likely to be aggressive, what prostate cancer is not. But even more recently, over the last five years, we've, saw, we've seen development of tissue diagnostics, just like you do, do biopsy for standard histology. These days we can do biopsy for also at the same time 
for when we know uh, uh, a person has prostate cancer for genetic markers, for genetic makeup of cancer and combination of MRI and uh, uh, this genetic tissue analysis, what we call radiogenomics is extremely precise in addressing exactly the, time, the kind of clinical challenge we had for so many years. What men needs, need to be treated and what men do not need to be treated. Um, Kvok, do you want to comment about treatment or anything about specific about- Yeah, sure, I mean, uh, <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> in terms of treatment, uh, there's been a record number of drugs that have been approved in the last decade. And, you know, like, a, a, we often say prostate cancer survival is better. And some people think it's because of screening. Some people think it's because of all the new drugs that have come along. And it's probably a combination of both. But uh, the bottom line is that there are much better treatments than we had like, you know, 10, 15 years ago, uh, new lines of treatment. And just an anecdote that I thought was really interesting is that some of these drugs, people did analyses where they looked at, okay, you have this big trial um, enrolling, you know, a thousand men. And they looked at the data of African-American men and white men. So these are people who actually got to a trial. As we know, African-American men, uh, you know, and the Asian, actually all minorities tend to be underrepresented in these right. kind of uh, yes. trials. But yes. when you look at the data of these trials, and this is two studies I'm thinking about, African-American men in these state receiving the drug did better than white men, had better survival. So again, it really emphasizes this question of access to care. You have this disease that is known to kill twice as, you know, twice as much African-American men than white men. But here, if you actually make it to the trial and receive the drug, African-American men do either the same, if not significantly better. Um, so again, I really want to emphasize, and you'll see from my, when I talk, you know, uh, uh, in a couple of weeks is like access to care is such an important aspect of the disparity issue that we see today. President Curry, you know, I, I listened to Dr. Tran and that's impressive what he's just said, but what's the messaging? How, how, are, we, how are we making it? How are we getting to these? Uh, how are we getting the message about these trials to save our lives? Is something dramatically changing in healthcare? Uh, that's creating a, an open door in terms of trials, especially around well, the issue of prostate cancer. Well, it's interesting. I serve on uh, Harvard Chan School, created a community review board, a community oh. review panel that I serve on uh, with Karen Emmons and Rebecca Lee and uh, Shoba. Um, and we are now a few months in where uh, doctors and their researchers come before the community panel and present their projects. Mm -hmm. And they get feedback on the equity, right? So, you know, that phrase born out of the George Floyd moment was nothing about us without us. And that's about clinical research as well. If you want to talk about creating drugs and life-saving measures, we should be involved in every aspect of that research. On the research side, right, we know Black and Brown researchers have complained for years that they're not funded, they don't receive resources, they're not respected, they don't get uh, a placement in journals. And then we know on the, on the other side that we have a distrust that was born out of lived experiences since 1619 that we need to talk about. So I think quite frankly, Bishop, to your point, we gotta be involved. Um, part of that too is messaging. Um, we are dying at a higher rate of way too many diseases, including prostate cancer. And I would argue, and you've probably, you've heard me say this before, Bishop, and other panels that you've hosted, we're weathered to it. Yes. We become weathered to being sick yes. and weathered to dying. And I've used that example of asthma when they say they came in and asked the black parents to rate their kids asthma for one to 10. And those black parents, like my mother, had asthma and rated them four or fives. And they came back and, and the doctors rated those kids asthma as they were eight, nines, and tens on a scale of one to 10. And the doctor explained to this, this was Dr. Lauren Smith at the time from DPH. And she said that folks were, were, were weathered, right? They were used to being in Boston City Hospital or Good Sam, right? Um, they were used to being in the hospital once a month or once a quarter, and they were used to taking the flow of an al alupentin. For the context of this prostate cancer conversation, we're used to auntie and uncle, uncle Nim and grandma and uncle and dad and cousin dying of prostate cancer. Yes. And we've not, and we, and we don't think we can control it. We can't fix it. We can't intervene in ways that we can. So we, you and I, and 
yeah. with Dr. Stern's leadership at Admi Tech and Dr. Tran and all the other folks that Dr. Chandler and, and uh, right. Dr. Ojikutu, Ojikutu, all these other folks that I get to engage with, we got to collectively figure out a strategy that says, no, we need to unweather you to death in sickness. And part of that is getting a primary care provider, demanding a test, right? Because, you know, one of the things about white folks, and I'll, I'll make this ratio for this comment, white folks going to demand their care. That's true. <laughs> they ain't gonna come in and say, well, I don't want to enter, I don't want to be a doctor, I don't want right. to seem like I'm being yeah. a, a hypochondriac, or I don't want to seem like I'm they're gonna say, hell, give me care. I need you to test me, even though I'm three years from this test. I want this test. We need to be zealous advocates for our care. And yeah. we need to stop being afraid to engage the system yeah. to treat us in a way that will save our lives. Yeah, Michael, listen, uh, I, 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 I well, we're acting as if we're in my my living room having this conver this comfortable conversation, Mike. Uh, listen, I'll burn your living room. Yeah, <laughs> but the, the bottom, the bottom, you and I both know that our people, that our people are so doggone intimidated. Uh, when we get into the doctor's office, and if the doctor says no, I'm not doing a PSA. This is a national standard. We back down, Michael. We back down. Um, you know, I'm I'm empowered and encouraged. You and I are educated men. I'm empowered and, and encouraged by Dr. Trend and, and the years with Dr. Stern to have these pointed conversations. But I, you know, I'm not going to uh, say it's been easy because it hasn't been easy. Um, so let, let me just I'm gonna just pivot really quickly because I know we're, we're over time, Dr. Trend. The things, the, the music that you've brought to my community's ears today around inequality and around institutional racism. Respectfully, are your colleagues listening to you? I, I'm sorry to put yeah, you on. No, the, that's, that's, I have to ask you. I, I, I think people are coming around. Like, this is my sincere, honest answer. I think people are okay. coming uh, around to this. I think that, uh, you know, what we have seen in society. Uh, in the last 18 months, 24 months, as you know, people have made the connections. You know, the same. I, I mean, this is like off topic, but think NFL, right? See where yeah. NFL was a couple of years ago. And now people are like, oh, maybe, maybe there's a problem. Maybe we should acknowledge it. I, I, I feel it's a little bit like that. I think that uh, you, if three years ago you were walking around and saying, oh yeah, prostate cancer is not just a biology issue in African American, it's also access to care, people would be looking at you saying, what, we know there's, we know it's genetic, you know, why, why, are you, mm. why, are you, why are you talking about this? But I think today, if you mentioned that, people are, finally, you know, people are acknowledging saying, okay, maybe there's an access to care, maybe there's structural racism, like, at least I know, I know you're like, well, like big eyes, right? But this is, we're making some progress. progress I, I, yeah. Because three, four years ago, you would bring this up and it would be deaf ears, you know, people would be like, you know, what are you talking about? You're trying to change everything we already know or so so I, I I think there's 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 some progress but there's there's a lot to be done uh you know a lot a lot of uh our conversation today has been about empowering African-American men men of color to go and get the care they deserve I and maybe it's on my me being a physician in the system doing research but I also feel that the system has to change right I mean yeah. yes we we need to do all what we can do to educate to empower to advocate for you know, uh, individuals of color to get the care they deserve. But I, I think the system has to change. And, and this is where I bring in my Canadian heritage. You know, in Canada, mm. like it's a fee-for-service system. People don't uh, often realize that. It's not, it is a single payer system, but it's still fee-for-service. Physicians get paid to do procedures and to see people, but they don't get paid differently depending on their race or their insurance or, or things like that, right? Across the but, board? But, but like, yeah, so you, if oh. you're in Canada, you are, and you are a citizen, you go to the hospital, it doesn't matter who you are, how rich you are, or what you, like, you walk in, and we care for you, and we get the exact same fee for the same service for, you know, that, for that, for that thing. Here, physicians don't get, physicians and hospitals do not get paid the same, depending on your insurance, in network, out of network, you know, all that kind of stuff. And that system is fundamentally unfair. You know, it's a form of, you know, structural racism in a way. And then, uh, you know, after that, you know, like people fight against the system, but they still, they can't do it because if the hospital blocks people uh, at the entrance, depending on your insurance and stuff, 
you know, physicians can want to make a difference and, and patients can advocate for themselves. But, you know, if we can't get them in the trial because they don't have the right insurance, then, you know, it's, it's a problem, right? And somebody needs to fix that. Well, well Dr. Trin, you said, you, you, Dr. Trin's been saying some fighting words. You be careful. <laughs> I'm going, Mike, I'm sorry. No, I, I'm just going to say to Dr. Trin's point, you know, I, I think we tend to think all of this is revelatory. Like we just got mm. here in the last year. I just want to lift up that there were black researchers and black doctors raising these issues a long, long time, time ago. ago. So, you know, I posted on social media recently. I said, uh, I'm glad so many are waking up and others are woke, but some of us are insomniacs. Yeah. The reality is these are not new issues. In the medical research, the journals will show you people have been talking about the root causes of these diseases and that they're not um, biological, that not only biological, that there are other factors, factors. that contribute to um, poor uh, conditions and outcome. Let's, let's stop thinking George Floyd and COVID-19 woke us up. Um, it forced people to come to the truth because they didn't want to see it, but it's always been clear that if you want to believe that a race of people are more prone to be incarcerated because they're criminals, or more likely to disease, die of a disease because they don't pull their pants up and they don't eat right. Shame on you for Ew. believing that. Well, that was that was President Curry with fighting words too. <laughs> Dr. Stern, do you have some? <laughs> Absolutely. And I'm listening to this conversation. I'm thinking uh, wow. with, all the, with all the problems in the medical system, mm. patients have choices of doctors. As, as Kwok uh, pointed out, it is fee for service system. Okay. Yeah. And I cannot, yeah. and I, throughout this conversation, I cannot stop thinking about one of the leading pastors in Massachusetts who I greatly admire, an African American man. And we had a, uh, um, a couple of awareness events, a couple of annual awareness events in his church for men. And in a second, annual event, he stood up and he shared his story. And what he said as a 60 year old man or so, he asked his doctor for PSA testing. Yes. Doctor started giving him, giving him a song kind of dance. Mm -hmm. And he said, look, either you give me PSA testing or you will not be my doctor anymore. I needed to hear that. Fundamentally important for every African American man yes. to understand. You do not have to have this doctor. You have a choice. And you do not stop until you get a doctor that will give you the care that will save your life. The care that will save your life. And we, we got to end it there. So listen, we have an event coming up on June 17th. The event topic is labeled prostate cancer awareness and the times of the COVID-19 pandemic is going to be on June 17th at 6.30 p.m. Further information, please contact president, uh, well, former president of our branch, Steve Bernard at 508-942-1667 or visit www.ADMETEC.org. I want to thank Dr. Tren. President Curry and Dr. Stern for your pointed conversation around how we not only how we can save the lives of African Americans, but also giving us some very strong talking points when we're in the office of the physicians. We appreciate the conversation around technology, how things are have improved. We have a better chance of living with respect to prostate cancer. But again, it seems that the conversation needs to begin around what happens once we get in to that physician's office. Listen, I am Bishop, Bishop Tony Branch. This has been the NAACP Forum. Once again, we are Brockton's Choice for Civil Rights News. Thank you all. Good evening. Mm -hmm.